Welcome to another episode of How I Discovered My Gift with yours truly, David D. Simons. I'm honored and delighted to have today's guest on, Jose Gonzalez. Born and raised in the Washington Heights neighborhood of New York City, he's a former chef, executive chef, a serial entrepreneur, wealth strategist, and mind coach. Formerly known as the Keto Master Chef, he overcame over 20 years of struggling with health and weight, and since adopting a ketogenic lifestyle, was able to to in tw- uh to to lose a hundred pounds in five months. My God, a hundred pounds in five months, and has helped hundreds of people lose weight and restore their health. In 2022, he pivoted his business to focus on financial literacy and investing, and subsequently was able to create a six-figure income in just 90 days. So you already know he's going to bring the heat. 100K plus in 90 days. His goal is in 2023 is to help 25 people to create a six-figure lifestyle as well. He's the founder and host of the Wealth Mindset Podcast, which uh, launches April 11, 2023 at 7 a.m. He's a man of precision. His podcast helps Christian men improve their mindset, money, and marriages. Three M's that will we need all need, right? M- mindset, Amen. money, and marriages. His latest book will be released this summer titled Stay Broke, How to Overcome the limiting beliefs that keep people broke. Thank you so much, my brother, for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here, my man. Wow, wow, wow. Well, let's let's go back to the journey, man. Uh, just take us back to to, to New York City, uh, growing up, and just as a child, man, walk, walk us through the journey till now. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate it. Uh, so I'm a, I live in Philadelphia now. I'm originally from New York City. You know, God brought me here. Uh, he used my wife to intercede, which I thank him for that. And, um, you know, I, I grew up, my parents came here from the Dominican Republic, you know, just a humble upbringing, what, what we would call, you know, poor to middle class. Uh, they both had, you know, laborious jobs, but, you know, they really instilled in us a education you know, reading. And and really, I, I'm very thankful for them because they pretty much, you know, sacrificed a lot of their goals and personal ambitions. I'm sure uh, they impressed upon us that, you know, their goal for us was to have opportunities that were not afforded to them, you know, in their upbringing. So that's something that I've always, you know, kept inside of me. And it's one of the things that fuels me in, uh, in pushing forward, you know, like making things better, not just for myself in the present, but for my children and, and future generations. So, and yeah, I mean, like I said, humble beginnings, you know, I, I, I like I said, I was a, a former chef. I, I learned to cook. I got that love from my mom. I was always in the kitchen with her. And even though I did wind up becoming a, a professional chef, for me, it was really about the conviviality that comes from food, right? Like every important celebration is is consummated with food, right? Baptisms and and communions and you know graduations, weddings, baby showers. Like food is an integral part of culture and how people connect. Um, and it, and it's you know it's it's usually whenever you have a good story, a good memory, <laughs> there's some type of food involved. So that kind of fueled fueled that fire. I wound up going in that direction. I was a chef uh, for over twenty years. Uh, but as you mentioned at the top of the show, I struggled with health and weight for for a long time. And, uh, you know, one of the things that took me down the rabbit hole of really getting healthy was that about six years ago, my mom suffered uh, three major strokes in a, in a very short period of time. And, you know, I was embarrassed about the fact that, you know, at, at my early 40s, I didn't really know what a stroke was. But uh, once that happened, I came to find out that pretty much everyone in my family, you know, passes or suffers from a major stroke or heart attack, like all of my aunts and uncles, like that's kind of like our exit strategy. Right. And so that that kind of took me down this rabbit hole of health. And I was started looking at my own life and I was like, are my kids going to have to change my diapers, you know, 30 years from now? So that that's really what kind of instigated like, all right, you need to focus on your health. Um and so the, you know, the weight loss, people always focus on weight loss, but actually weight loss is just a byproduct of, of getting healthier. So, you know, once I made that commitment, um, it just it just fueled me. And, and that so that's why I got, you know, those astronomical results. But um, but since then, I've been able you know to help a lot of people in that endeavor as well. So. Wow. Wow. So <clears throat> this is this is fascinating. So I, I, I am curious when you when you started off as a kid were you watching mom's family family members cook and it just like that that inspired or i mean because i i don't want to i don't want to underscore something here because you just make it seem so easy 
you you became an executive chef and that's that's like people hear like what you see on tv like it's it's not easy it's it's and it's not easy to get there like not everybody can become an executive chef it's like a ceo of the kitchen if i'm not mistaken absolutely right? so i just don't want to i don't want to skip past i want we're going to get into the wealth stuff but yeah. but to climb in that journey i want you to walk me through that of what that took and where that inspiration started it kind of it sounds like from your family right yeah so my mom is like the best cook in the family right and a lot of us say that but it was this is like public opinion right so whenever we had holiday gatherings everyone was like i want to go to auntie venezia's house right like everyone wanted my mom's cooking she put a lot of love into it you know and uh, you know she didn't take shortcuts you know we didn't have this huge budget but she really, you know, one of the things that she taught me early on is like, if you want to manage a household, you need to learn how to manage a kitchen. OK, because that's that cool. that's kind of how you, you know, it's 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 the one variable cost, like your mortgage is going to be fixed. Right. Your electrical bill is going to be mostly fixed because you have heating in the winter. You got cooling in the summer. So those things are kind of, you know, very, you know, fixed. But the food cost is kind of like where you either make or break the household budget. And uh, so so just seeing, you know, how impacted people were, how excited people were um, at, at eating her food. Right. And I knew it was a, it was a labor of love. She was very humble with it. it. It's just she was just good at it. It's something that that, you know, that that was a part of her. And so I realized early on that it was a great way to create connectivity. Right. Like I even have people sometimes I'll do a dinner party at my house and I have friends who are vegan. Right. They, they'll put on social media. They'll they, you know, they live the vegan lifestyle and then they show up to my house and they're like, I'm like, oh, I made you something vegan. They're like, I'm not vegan today. <laughs> like whatever you're making. <laughs> and I think that I just carry over the fact that I love to to use it as kind of like a center point to bring people together Um and, you know, I, I, I you see the joy, right, that 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 people have when they come together, they share experiences. But like the food is like this underlying and conduit to, to all of that. So ironically, when I you know, I wound up I was actually catering and, and cooking for people before I even went to culinary school. Right. Like wow. my first daughter was born in 95. Her baby shower was probably my first official catering gig. And everyone looked at me like I was crazy. Like, you're going to you're going to cook. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to cook. Uh, and, you know, thanks to God, uh, it, it was a success. Um, but that just fueled it. So I wound up going to culinary school. And really, I went to culinary school because I wanted to cook for my friends and family, right? Like I wanted to mm. to bring the expertise of culinary acumen right to the people that I love. So early on in my career, I didn't go the restaurant route of being a lion cook or anything like that. I kind of started doing private catering. Um, God bless me. And I was able to get, you know, some very amazing clients in New York City, which gave me referrals. I started to build, build a name for myself as a private chef and caterer. Uh, I worked with a lot of different catering companies as well, just to like, you know, learn more, right, improve my skills. So I, I did that for about 10 years. Um, and then I went full on executive chef. I started off as a consultant uh, with different food operations, uh, wine bars and things like that. Uh, and then wound up being a full a full on executive chef. But it was, you know, it was it was definitely not, you know, an overnight. Like they say, it takes about 20 years to become an overnight success. So but it's, it's in any discipline or endeavor, you know, any discipline of endeavor, it takes a lot of hard work to achieve success. So, you know, if you don't genuinely have a passion for it, if you don't genuinely have a love for it, it's going to be hard to push through, right? Because it was a lot of, when I look back, I tell people this all the time, man, I missed out on a lot of important things. I missed out on a lot of picture days and school trips. And, you know, in the hospitality industry, when people are often celebrating, you're working, you know? So it, it also, ironically, is one of the things that fueled me to pivot in my business, right? Because you just get to a point, hey, I still love cooking, but it's, it's very time demanding, right? Mm -hmm. And so you just get to a point where you start to value as you mature, you know, as a man, as an adult, as you mature, your wants and desires, you know, start to also, you know, mature with you. And right. so, it, you know, it ran its course, but every single second that, that I was in that in that space was, you know, was definitely a treasurable. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you for taking us through through the journey. Um, when you think about your most dominant gift, what is that? 
Uh, so that's a great, great question. You know, I think that my love for helping people is probably my my most dominant gift. And I think that I, I feel strongly as though it's something that I got from my mother, right? I have to share this quick story. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, my parents were believers, right? But like my mother never went to church, right? And but she always heavily preached the word of God. Like everything that she said was was a scripture. Like, you know, and she would impress it upon me. Like, you you have to believe in God. You have to rely on him, right? Like he's the one that gets us through. Right. But I, I would see that she never went to church, right? And so in my mind, I would question, like, is my mom really a believer? She's just saying these things that she learned. And then I had an experience that really shaped uh definitely was shaped me as a person. I remember I've always been good with math. And, uh, uh, you know, I grew up in the Catholic school. So at Lent, you know, there's 40 days in Lent, we would get these like envelopes where every day you're supposed to put a quarter after 40 days, it's 10 bucks and you turn it in. Well, for years, my, you know, I would do this, but my mom never turned it in. And I would be like, what's up with that? Well, one year, I must've been like 10, 11 years old. Uh, we went to Dominican Republic one summer. And so we took all of those coins that she had been collecting for all of that time. Plus she had all these little piggy banks and she converted that. We went to the bank. I remember I had to like put all the coins in rolls and, you know, put the account number on it and uh, change that into dollars. We took that money, went to Dominican Republic. And she said to me, you know, there's a promise that I've always had. And uh, so we went to this poor, poor, poor section of Dominican Republic called Los Mina, which is probably still one of the most impoverished areas in the world today. Mm. And uh, so we we exchanged the uh, the dollars into local currency, and and she had me break it up into denominations envelopes of fifty, a hundred, or one hundred and fifty pesos, which is not a lot. It's like a in dollars at that time was just a couple of bucks, but for the local currency, it's you know it's a, it's a good amount of money. Yeah. And so we went to this hospital, and we walked to this hospital, and it, this was surreal. We went to this maternity ward, which is unlike anything that I've ever experienced, right? Like here, when people go into labor delivery, you have your own room, right? Your family can hang out with you. Like you got TV, not over there. Mm -hmm. It was this maternity ward. And we, I remember we were walking by these rooms, these quote unquote labor and delivery rooms. And on one side, there was three stainless steel tables, not beds. All right. With a sheet on them. And on one side of the room, you had three women in full labor. On the other side of the room, you had three women that had just given birth <laughs> with their baby wrapped in a blanket. Yeesh. And we just went through the ward and she was giving out envelopes to different people. And then we got to the waiting room. She had one envelope left and she just kind of like scanned the room and she went over and handed it to this lady. And once this lady realized uh, what was in the envelope, she just started screaming, exalting. She had literally just had her baby hours ago. She's sitting in a waiting room with regular folk. And she was literally praying to God because she had no way of getting home. Her family was so poor that no one can come pick her up. Right. And, and she couldn't afford, you know, a, a cap. And she was literally sitting there just praying to God for a way to get home with her baby when my mom hands her this envelope. And so that really kind of shaped me into, you know, realizing like here I was judging my mom thinking, you know, that she was some fake Christian or whatever. But it, it, it made me realize that, listen, you know, tithing and going to church and all of these things are important. But what I feel is the most important thing, you know, as living as a Christian is ministry. Right. Mm -hmm. Whether that means being part of a ministry. Right. But it, like we grew up, like I said, poor. Right. And, and that's just middle class is just a fancy title to say that you're poor. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we didn't grow up with a lot of means, but she showed me like it doesn't really matter what you have. You know, like God calls each and one each and every one of us mm -hmm. to impact others. Right. To be a blessing to others. It is not about how much you have. It's about the intention in your heart. And so that that's always been, you know, for for lack of a better word, my superpower um, is for me, it's not about what I have. It's just about, you know, God calls us to be willing in heart and spirit to be a blessing to other people. You know, that's right. That's right. 
Wow, that's powerful. Thank you for sharing that story. So this gift of helping people, actually, you know, I think there's um, a Bible um, verse around ministry of helps, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the spiritual gifts. Um, and this, this, this spirit of helping, where else did you see this um, across your journey? Is, is that what made you like enjoy cooking? It's like you're helping bring, you know, joy and laughter and love to the event. Like where else did you like looking back, right? Cause sometimes we don't know going from childhood what our gift is, but when looking back and then you go look back to the journey and you're like, oh yeah, that's always been there. So can you recall uh, other moments or, or other instances of seeing that gift in action? Yeah, there, there's a, so actually that same summer while we were in Dominican Republic and like, and I can't, you know, I can't stress enough how my parents came from very humble beginnings, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, as I think growing up in America, sometimes we're, you know, we see people who are poor and definitely struggling, but even compared to other parts of the world here, we're really, really blessed. Yeah. Um, and so that summer, like we, we were, we were in the capital in Santo Domingo when that happened, but then we went to visit where my family is actually from, right. Which is like a hilly, rocky area. And here I am with my little kangaroo sneakers, but yet all my little cousins that live there, like they're, they're running around barefoot, right. Ooh. Happy, happy as, as can be. Yeah. And I remember that that summer. So we were, we were, um, you know, the adults would go off during the day and do stuff, work or whatever. The kids, we kind of like hung out and played all day. And since I was the American kid, like all my little cousins looked up to me. Mm -hmm. So I remember that my cousins, I was very close to my aunts and my cousins and my family. One morning after breakfast, they're like, oh, we're going to go to the river and watch, wash clothes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, cool. I'll see you. I'll see you at noon, right? I'll see you for lunch. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. we're going to be gone all day. You know, we'll be back. And I'm like, you're going to be gone all day washing our clothes, right? So I created like this little crew of like little rascals. <laughs> I got all my cousins together and I made this plan that we were going to cook them lunch. Wow. Right. And, and so the thing is that mind you, th th we didn't have a, a finished house. Like the, it was, they, they, they lived in little shacks. They didn't even have floors. It was just dirt floors. Right. Mm -hmm. So the kitchen was like this firewood pit. <laughs> Okay. It wasn't a gas stove or an electric stove. Right. Mm -hmm. And so here I was like a little 11 year old kid thinking that I was going to get to use the kitchen. Right. Yeah. Cause I got to cook at home and they were like, yeah, they just laughed me off. All I was able to negotiate in my pleading was a little pot, right? Like here, you can have a pot. I'm like, all right, cool. You know? So I got my little cousins together, you know, since I had a little bit of money, right. Cause my parents would give me a little allowance or whatever. By our, by, it technically, it was very little money, but yeah. compared to their conditions, it was a, a little sun. Mm. And so we went, we went to the store and the store wasn't like here. You didn't buy a bottle of oil. Like you would go in and be like, I need a dollar of oil, right? I need right. two eggs. Okay. Because people didn't have money right. like that. So we just put together this plan, got some eggs, got some salami, got some plantains, got some, you know, some cassava root. And we literally in this one pot, we gathered dry sticks, some rocks, made our own little pit, right? And then at lunchtime, we all had to come back so nobody was suspicious. But it took us literally the whole day for us to cook these plantains, these green bananas, this mm. cassava root, yuca, and mm. fry a few eggs and some salami. And so at the end of the day, like when they were done, um, when they were done with the washing, the clothes is when we finally came down with this, with this banquet of food. Right. And, and they were just like, you know, they were just, you know, so happy. They sat down, they ate their food. And it's funny because, you know, a lot of my family members still, you know, talk about it to this day. No way. But for me, it wasn't like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to save the day. It was just like, how can these, you know, how can they go all day without eating to wash our clothes? Wow. Right. Like it just didn't it just didn't add up because here in America, again, like I said, a lot of the things that we we look at as though we're impoverished, we're actually extremely, extremely blessed. Wow. So I, I think like, again, going back to, you know, to that spirit of, of, of conviviality and sharing and, and, mm -hmm. and acts of service that were instilled in me by my parents. It was just for me, it was just natural. Like it wasn't like, you know, it's it so that that's what's kind of like carried over. But I always yeah. think back and, you know, in that story, because 
for me, I just thought it was something cool to do, right? Right. Um, almost rebellious, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, you know, like the impact that it had on them, you know, has never been lost upon me. And and what I realized is that, you know, the smallest act of service in somebody else, you know, in the eyes of the of the person that's receiving, you know, is is can be a really big thing. You know, it can be a really big thing. And when I hang out with my family now, though, they'll, they'll bring it up. Like, you remember the time that you cooked for us and you were just a little kid? Right. Wow. To this day. But I wasn't thinking about that at that time. I was just thinking about how they're going to go all day without eating wow. just to wash our clothes, you know? So um, just curious I, and, and I guess what they were doing was also an act of service, too. Right. Yeah. How, how, how old were you? I'm just curious. I was. Yeah, I was like 10 or 11. Wow. Wow. So that spirit is just. All through you, man. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, so Jose, talk to us about. You talked about it a little bit that there takes a it takes a discipline, a hard work, right? In in everything you do, and for, from being an executive shift to now being a, a wealth coach and um, a wealth strategist, and and from you know building up the the fortitude to be able to lose a hundred pounds in five in five months. Um, talk to us about the the importance of discipline and in your development and, and and also your personal development that you put into yourself. Because I like to talk about this because a lot of people focus on the outer of what everybody can see. Ah, oh, yes, he's achieving it. He's an executive chef. He's making six plus figures. He's doing. He's killing the game in business. But a lot of people don't see the roots. What's underneath? What actually you developed? The person you had to become to 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 become that person so if you could talk about that yeah i i love this question you know you know discipline and consistency is something that a lot of people struggle with right and i think that a kind of the reason for that is that sometimes we have this goal and you know as you embark on your goal you're going to come upon, upon obstacles right and you know that's what's going to test your conviction Right. That's what's going to test what you really want, it, it, how, how bad you really want it. And what people fail to realize is that, you know, a whenever you're doing good, the enemy is going to attack that. <laughs> OK, so so it's like you, you have to understand that. Right. You have to understand that a lot of times people also take a utopian approach to any process. Right. They think about the 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 the, the accomplishment. And don't realize what it takes to accomplish that. So to answer your question about, you know, what is discipline and, and how that plays a role in achieving any level of success. You know, Jim Rome says that discipline is the bridge between your goals. Right. And, and the success. Mm -hmm. And and to and, and just to take a step back for me, I think that and this is something that I've also gotten from my mentors and a lot of successful people that I that I've been able to glean knowledge from is that it starts with a strong enough why. Okay. Now, see, mothers understand this very clearly, right? right? Mothers are nurturing. They love their children. It doesn't matter how tired they are, right? When their kids are hungry, when their kids cry, they're going to get up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if they themselves were hungry, they might just be like, you know what? I'm just going to go to sleep hungry, right? But that mm -hmm. why is, is what's going to get you up. Mm -hmm. OK, so sometimes people, they have a goal. Maybe their goal is to make money. Why? Why do you want to make money? OK, wanting to make money is a great goal. But why? Mm -hmm. If your goal is to make money for the purpose of having money, when things get hard, you will lack, you know, the discipline to push through. Mm -hmm. But if you say like, you know, this money is going to help me, you know, create contribution. It's going to help me take care of my household and provide. This money is going to help me, you know, help my church and and, and get in a new building and help it in with this particular ministry. You know, I'm going to be able to do a food drive and, and feed people like you have to have a why. Mm -hmm. And right. So th there's a quote that I like, which says that your your why has to be bigger than your butt. Right. Mm -hmm. Because. You say this, oh, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this, but this, but this happened, right? Mm. Your why has to be bigger than that's that. Good. It has to be something that's going to help you push through. Mm. So discipline becomes easier 
when you fully understand your why. Okay. Uh, Without that, you're going to be tempted to quit at the first sign of trouble. And again, if you're trying to do anything that's actually, you know, quote unquote, good, um, that's substantial, uh, that's great. The enemy is going to attack that. You're going to face obstacles over and over and over again. So, you know, one of the big, you know, big myths of successful people is that somehow they had it easy or somehow they got lucky. Right. Mm-hmm. I tell people luck is when preparation meets opportunity. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so a lot of people think like, oh, you're just lucky. Right. You No, I put in the work. Right. I follow through. But it goes back to having that strong why. Right. All right. Because you're going to be met with obstacles and challenges. And the only thing that's going to push you through, that's going to allow you to have that discipline. And another thing that people have to understand about discipline is this. I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. Mm. It doesn't matter what you want to accomplish. All right. There's going to be a part of that process that you don't like. OK, like, for example, I go to the gym, I work out. I don't like it. <laughs> Okay, mm-hmm. I don't do it because I like it. I do it because of the of the areas of my life that it helps improve. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I, I want to be active. I want to run around with my grandkids. You know, I want to. I want to. It gives me more mental fortitude, right? And so, what you have to understand is that it doesn't matter what it is that you want to do. There's going to be a part of that that you don't like. But right. disciplined people do what they have to do, regardless of how they feel. Mm. You know, it's not about how you feel. It's about why are you doing this? Mm. Okay. So a lot of times people struggle because they're like, you know what? Today, I don't want to do this. Today, I don't feel like doing this, you know, but ultimately people who are successful don't work off of feelings. Mm. They're accountable. They do the things that they have to do regardless of how they feel. Going back to that example of the mom, the mom may not feel like getting up. But yeah. it's it's her responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's her why she, you know. So if she, if she can easily stay in her feelings, right? Yeah. But that that's not the way the world works. It doesn't matter what you want to accomplish. It you have to put your feelings aside and understand what's my why. Why is this accomplishing? So that's really that's really what discipline is. Discipline mm-hmm. is doing what you have to do when you have to do it, regardless of how you feel about it. Mm, that is so good. That is so good, man. I thank you for breaking that down. I, I know listeners are going to be blessed by that and really getting into the discipline. Nobody, You're right. Nobody talks about the fact that it's not always the thing, the most pleasant thing. In business, there's going to be things you hate doing. Like you said, from uh, in, in health, there's going to be things. And, and I, I'd be remiss if I don't speak about this aspect because I know listeners are wondering because that's really rare to see somebody lose 100 pounds in five months, wow, the level of discipline that takes. Could you talk about, and I think your why, just from hearing you earlier, was hearing about your mom and, and the things that she went through. And I'm sure that stayed in the forefront of your mind and being for your grandkids. So if you could just take us through that, what what all transpired and how did you do that? So, yeah, now I'm going to give you the how, the how I did it. But what I want to say is that, you know, it comes down to mindset, Right. And and I, and I want to just start with this part here, because, you know, when people want to learn how to do something, they always focus on the how to. What are the steps? What are the strategies? What exactly did you do? I can give you that. I can tell you that. But if you don't have the mindset, it's useless. Right. Mm-hmm. If you don't have the mindset that I had, you're not going to follow through. Mm-hmm. OK, so one thing is a lot of times people will say to me, oh, can I lose 30 pounds in a month? Can I lose 50 pounds in three months? I don't know. Okay. I can't answer that for you. Mm -hmm. All right. Because, you know, weight loss and getting healthy, it's about hormones. Like we've been taught it's calorie in, calorie out. That's not exactly true, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But it's more about hormones. But when people say to me, oh, can I lose 20 pounds in a month? Yeah, maybe you can. Maybe you can't. It's really up to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... You know, there's so many factors that have to work in. But but let me let me get into the how to. So one thing that I did was at the time I was living in New York City right. um, and, you know, walking is my drug of choice. <laughs> OK, right. I love to walk. Now, some people like to run. Some people like to jog. Some people like to do different things. I love walking. Mm. 
And I emphasize this because sometimes people will say to you, if I say to you, oh, well, David, you want to lose 100 pounds in five months, you need to walk X amount of steps per day. Well, A, your lifestyle may not be conducive to that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, You may not like walking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you do it, will you get the result? Yeah. Right. But it may not be possible for you based on certain parameters around what your real life looks like. Mm -hmm. So, A, it's best if you find some form of activity that you actually like. Mm -hmm. Because I used to walk at least, at least two hours a day. All right. If anyone's listened to this and they're in New York, I I was living in Queens in Jackson Heights and I was working in Midtown Manhattan and I walked to work every day. Wow. On days that I got out early, I might walk back. Wow. Okay. And, and, and there was days that I've walked the entire Island of Manhattan. Like oftentimes I would start around mid around Midtown, around the Intrepid in the forties and 12th Ave and walk all the way up to Washington Heights, 170th street along, along Riverside, along the water. Wow. Okay. That's quite a walk. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but I liked it. Okay. It was a meditative time. It was a time with God. It was time when I would be in a creative mindset flow. And I wish that at the time we had some some of the gadgets that we have now, because I might have been even more productive. Mm-hmm. But but it was something that 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 worked for me, right? Mm-hmm. I would never be on a walk and be like, man, I hate this. You know, oh, you know what? Let me just jump off the train. In mm-hmm. fact, my son, I lived in I lived on 170. My my son was in Harlem on 125th Street. And oftentimes his mom would get upset with me because she would be like, you know, I would walk down there instead of taking the train. The train was like 10 minutes. Mm. But instead, I would walk 45 minutes. So sometimes I was five minutes late, you know, mm. and she was like, let me guess, you were walking again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes she was like, just jump on the train on 137th. And I'd be like, so that came natural to me. So the yeah. how to, the how to was that I was walking at least 15 to 20,000 steps a day. Mm. Um, that's kind of the how to. I was eating a low carb diet. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and you know, what I tell people about carbs and again, that's, that's a whole other, you know, mm-hmm. seminar, but what I tell people about the low carb lifestyle, the reason that I did it is because it gave me confirmation bias. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's what, so a lot of people say to me, so I need to do, do you, you know, do keto to lose weight. No, not necessarily. All right. There's many different disciplines and, and, and diets and protocols that you can follow to get healthy. You don't have to do keto. Now, mm-hmm. keto has a lot of benefits, right? It has a lot of health benefits, but you don't have to do keto. Mm-hmm. OK, I did it because it, it worked for me. Mm-hmm. All right. It gave me confirmation bias. It it, it, it it went along with the tenets of how I like to eat. Right. And that made it easier for me. OK, mm-hmm. so, again, the process is not going to be easy. But any little way that you can try to make it easier Mm. is going to be to your benefit. So the how to was I was walking 15 to 20,000 steps at least Mm -hmm. per day. Um, I was eating a low carb uh, diet. And the good thing about low carb is that uh, high fat diets are very satiated. Mm -hmm. So you actually wind up eating less, less frequently. And less in terms of volume. You know, one of the mm-hmm. things that carbs uh, does is that it, it suppresses this hormone in the brain called leptin. And leptin lets you know that you're full. So that's why when you're like having this big Thanksgiving meal or or you go to a buffet, you have all these carbs. And there's a point that you get to that you kind of feel as though you're getting full. But you you at least finish the food on your plate. And then at the end, you're like busting at the seams like, oh, I don't know how I ate that much. Right. Right. It's because carbs kind of like facilitated that. Mm. So I tell people sometimes, you know, if you just have the steak, if you just have the fish, if you just have, you know, whatever it is that you like and you omit the carbs, you'll actually be able to eat less. Mm. That's good. Right. So it's like if you have, as an example, rice and beans and chicken, you're going to eat more than if you just had chicken mm. or chicken and, and, and broccoli. Right. You're going to be able mm. to eat more with that with that carb. Mm. Because it suppresses it suppresses the leptin, so that's that's yeah. the how to. But like yeah. I said, it, it all starts with your mindset. I had a why that was mm-hmm. bigger than my butt. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it didn't matter. It didn't matter if it was raining. It didn't matter if it was cold. Wow. I was gonna walk. Wow. 
Okay. And, and so you need to first start off with that mindset, right? We talk about commitment, right? A lot of people are interested in something. Mm. Interest won't get you there. You have to be committed, mm. right? Like some people just want to be involved in the process. Other, they say the difference between uh, involvement and committed is that the, uh, is like ham and eggs, right? Mm -hmm. The chicken was involved, <laughs> but, but the pig was committed. <laughs> Right. So a lot of people yeah. are like they want to be involved. They, they're interested. But having, a, you know, being interested in getting healthy is not going to get you healthy. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to be committed. Commitment means right. I'm going to do it no matter what. Mm -hmm. No matter what. No excuses. Right? right. No matter how I feel going back to that discipline, yes. I'm going to get it done. So that that's where it starts. It starts with your mindset. It starts with you affirming that you're going to do this no matter what. Right. Right. No matter what. Respect. My God. That's awesome. That's awesome, Jose. Just blessing people, man. So take us now into the journey of you transitioning into this entrepreneurship. Well, you were already an entrepreneur, but but a wealth strategist and a mindset coach, because I can see it. I can see how you could you could help someone. I already I mean, I feel like my mind's being transformed right now. Like, forget the interest. I'm going to go for the commitment. Let's go. Right. Um, so talk to me about that. And, and, and then I've obviously got to tell us about this 100K uh, in, in, in or six figure plus in 90 days. Man. Yep. Yeah. So basically, you know, there's a lot of parallels between getting healthy and getting wealthy. Right. Mm -hmm. And just to, as a disclaimer, six figures is not wealth. Right. Because depending where you live, market adjustment, you can still be broke and be making six figures. Like, especially if you're in San Francisco, you're oh, yeah. struggling with six figures. Right. Um, with, with low six figures. However, there's a lot of parallels between, again, like I said, like we were talking about discipline, commitment, right? Because that's, that's really where it starts, right? It starts with your mindset, right? Your mindset is basically your set of, you know, your set of beliefs, which are influenced by your thoughts. So your thoughts, you know, will dictate your, your words, your words will dictate your beliefs, your beliefs dictate your actions, your actions will dictate your habits. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for you to get healthy, or for you to get wealthy, you need to adopt the habits of healthy people. You need to adopt the habits of wealthy people. So coming into, you know, when I pivoted into focusing on financial education, um, I already thankfully had that mindset. I understand I need to adopt the habits of wealthy people. Um, and so to, to answer your question, it, it kind of goes like this. What, what precipitated me switching my focus was the, um, A, the pandemic, right, had a lot to do with it mm -hmm. because a lot of people struggle financially. A lot of people were hurt, but a lot of people made money, mm -hmm. okay? Percentage-wise, a lot less people made money, but the amount of money that they made far exceeded, you know, the amount of, you know, so right. it kind of opened my eyes to like, you know, it really doesn't matter what's happening in the economy. It really is more about how you're positioned, right? Like if, Ooh, say, for example, a, a horse race, right? Yep. When those horses come out of the gates, right? That, that first part of the stretch, all the jockeys are trying to do, they're not trying to get ahead. They're just trying to position themselves. Okay. They're trying to position themselves. So that when you do get to that home stretch, then you can kick it into high gear, right? And 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 race to the finish line. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a lot of times people just don't know how to position themselves. So, you know, there's a few things that wealthy people do that, that non-wealthy people don't do, right? First of all, wealthy people have an emergency fund, mm -hmm. all right? They have at least six months of their living expenses before they go out and buy some flashy stuff, whatever it is that they're into, you know, sneakers, video games, go out clubbing, go to vacation, you know, uh, they, they, they first get that emergency fund, right? So the reason that most of the people were affected in the pandemic was that when they said, hey, you know, go home for two weeks, people weren't financially prepared for that. OK, they, they they they've never planned for hard times. Right. You just hope that the economy is going to be fine. But I would tell people all the time hope is not a strategy. Mm -hmm. So 
what I realized, one of my goals is to get wealthy, right? Because again, I want to make life better for my children and my fu and, and future generations and be able to have a bigger impact on the world. Like money is not the goal, right? Money is not the most important thing, but I think that money is very important. Mm -hmm. Right. And just to go on this quick tangent, there's a few reasons why mm -hmm. in marriages, money is very important. Right. OK, the number one reason that people get divorced is because of money. Mm -hmm. But guess what? And people making two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So so people making under six figures, the divorce rate is like 50 plus percent. Mm -hmm. But once you get to people making two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more the divorce rate drops to under 20%. Wow. All right. So what I'm saying is that, and, and anyone that's in a relationship will know, like the number one thing that people argue about is money, is finances, right? So money is very important. Like it's not going to be the, the fabric that keeps a relationship together, right. but it definitely could be something that splinters it. True. All right. Um, health. Okay. Again, if somebody said to me, hey, I'm going to give you $10 million today, but you die tomorrow, I wouldn't take that trade, mm -hmm. right? I, I'd rather wake up, right? So so right. being alive, being healthy is more important than money. But people that have money have better quality of life while they're alive. That's you're right. able to... You're able to afford a personal trainer. If that's what it if that's what it takes for you to stay on track. You're able to eat better, right? right. And I remember when I was a, a teenager and... Uh, and uh, Magic Johnson, right, got HIV. Up until Magic Johnson got HIV, anyone who got HIV had a 100% probability of being dead in 6 to 12 months. True. Okay? True. All of a sudden, <laughs> Magic Johnson gets HIV, and now people are living with HIV. Okay? Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm not, I, j I like to think that money has something to do with it, right? That's true. Able sure. <laughs> <laughs> so all I'm saying is like, again, it's not the most important thing. It shouldn't be the goal, but just understanding that it facilitates a lot of other things. So that time that we went to nationally, locally, regionally, globally, it really opened my eyes to, hey, I love what I'm doing here. But I, it focused my priority into getting wealthy and not just again, when I when I transformed my life with keto, great, I got the result, I got healthy, but I didn't stop there. Right. Then I started coaching people. I started creating courses. I started selling food because it's kind of like your mess becomes your message. Right. right. So it's not just like, oh, I got healthy. I got a six pack. I'm good. I'm going to help other people because I know just as I was, there's other people struggling with this. Mm -hmm. So my goal was not just to get wealthy, to improve my life, mm -hmm. but also to be able to teach other people. So mm -hmm. back to the how to, um, the fastest way for you to get anywhere is to find someone that already has what you want. That's right. Okay. Like you just said to me, how did you lose a hundred pounds in five months? Guess what? Go walk 20,000 steps a day, mm -hmm. eat low carb and come talk to me. <laughs> You know what I mean? Right. In two, three, four, five months, you're guaranteed to get the results, right? Right. If you do exactly what I did or mm -hmm. a variation of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um I was I was blessed to to partner with uh with some mentors, right? And uh and I just started learning about investing and 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 you know and and investing into real assets. And you know, the person that I partner with is someone, you know, who makes high six figures. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I just took the same mentality that I took from getting healthy, right? Which is like, hey, I don't know everything, mm -hmm. but I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to put in the work. And yeah. I told him, if that qualifies me, right, I'm in. He was like, that's all you need, right? And that's, and that's what anybody needs, mm -hmm. okay? Because a lot of times we want a result that we don't have. Mm -hmm. And then we see someone that has that result and they say to the, they say to you, all right, this is what, it, what you have to do. And you're like, ah, oh, I, I don't know about that. Right. All right, cool. I'm not mad at you. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you can't tell me that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, and again, another quick tangent, a lot of times there's something that a lot of people struggle with in present day in social media and putting yourself out there, which is imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. people feel like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't go out and make... Uh, videos about this to talk about this. And a lot of times the reason for that is that you identify with the message, but
but you don't really have the personal cachet or gravitas to deliver that message. Mm -hmm. So someone will look at someone like Tom Billy, who has all these videos and say, man, I'm making content and I'm, and I'm saying the same message as Tom Billy, you, mm -hmm. but I'm not getting the same traction. Well, did you build quest? Mm -hmm. Did you build a billion dollar business? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So that person that you're looking up to, they have success, mm -hmm. right? So right. when they say it, it means something. All right. Because they don't need you to subscribe to their ideas. Mm -hmm. Right. They're living good. Mm -hmm. And so often what I tell people is. What are you an expert at? Right. Right. So, like I said, I created a six figure income. Right. Mm -hmm. If someone said to me, hey, I want to become a millionaire. I can't help you with that yet, mm -hmm. but I can't help you with that now. Mm -hmm. OK, you need to go find someone who's a millionaire right. and do what they say. Right. So I don't help people become millionaires because I'm not a millionaire, mm -hmm. but I can help somebody make six figures because mm -hmm. I've done it. I right. can help somebody lose a hundred pounds because I've done it. Right. Right. So a lot of times people want to, they want, they want to be at this level, but you're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's kind of the mindset that I brought into, you know, making, making more money. Right. And so starting to create wealth. I said, I'm going to partner with someone who has a result that I want. Right. And whatever they did to do it, as long as it's within my code of ethics, because that's yeah. another important thing. Key. And, you know, like my mentor, in fact, who's a great person, I said to him, how did you, what did you do in your first 30 days? And he said to me, I did this, this and this and this. Well, there was two out of those things that I was not willing to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I'm not trying to say that he's yeah. that he's a bad person. I just wasn't willing to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I had to make my my bed and know like, OK, well, if I don't achieve the same results that he had in 30 days is because I wasn't willing to do mm. what he was willing to do. Mm -hmm. All right. And it's just like the road to success is this long highway. Yeah. You know, you can drive 30 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, 75, 70 miles an hour. You're going to get there as long as you don't stop. Right. right. For, you, you're going to get there. But it's just a matter of how fast you want to get there. That's good. Uh, so, so yeah, so I just, I, I, I had that parallel mindset mm -hmm. of like discipline, commitment, learning. Okay. Right. Because that's, 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 that's one of the caveats where people fall off, mm. right? They're not willing to humble themselves and learn from someone. Mm. There, there's actually something that's called the teachability index. Yes. And the teachability index Be is honest. your willingness to learn times your willingness to change. Mm -hmm. All right. And I just have to say this for anyone who's listening. If there's something in your life that you want mm -hmm. that you don't currently have, mm -hmm. you must change who you are. Right. Because if you were the type of person that would attract that, you would already have it. That's right. OK. Which means that whatever you're currently doing is not yielding that result. Right. So if, if someone is on the dating scene. And they say, oh, you know, I've been going on dates, but I, I keep, you know, attracting this and that. All right. What's the common denominator in all of that? You. Yeah. All right. You attract who you are. If you want somebody of value, you have to become someone of value. That's good. Okay. If you want to, if you want to, you know, be, be, you have to, you have to, it's always about, that's why they talk about the process, right? The process is more important than the journey because people want to just be there. You have to become that person. You have to yes. think like that person, walk like that person, talk like that person, dress like that person. And then people start looking at you like, man, you, you, you change. Yeah, I changed. Mm. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, so going back to, to, you know, the how to, it's that you need to find someone that's already has what, the result that you want. And then just, just copy their formula. You know, because, you know, like Nas said, no idea is original. There's nothing new under the sun. It's never what you right. do is how it's done. That's right. uh, and that's kind of like, you know, the mantra that, that I that I carry into, you know, creating my business, becoming, you know, financially uh, successful. So now that I've achieved this level of financial success, now I'm leveling up and partnering yeah. with people who, who are making millions. Right. But, but Jose, somebody might ask. 90 days. How did you do it in 90 days? Right. Like like that's. Like you talked about the highway and and the and the, the, the speed, you, you know, you were going a hundred miles. I mean, to do that in ninety days, most people won't make that in two years, three years, right? Plus, you know, um, but you did it, in, and I, I was looking at it from. 
from a standpoint, um, how much money is made is really about the time, right? So somebody could be a millionaire. They wait, stack up, you know, save and invest. By the by, the time they uh, uh, retire, sixty five, have a million plus, you'll be a millionaire. But if that takes you forty five years to get there, and if I can do that in a year, I think time is a is a factor. So I'm I'm, I'm paralleling that back to um, six figures plus in ninety days. That that time frame is is unusual, which Definitely. I love. Yeah, no. So so here's the thing. And, and this is what I teach people, right? I teach people how to do it. Now, full disclosure, similar to losing 100 pounds in five months, not everyone is going to do it, right? right? But what I tell people is like, all right, let's say it takes you six months. Let's say it takes you a year. Is it worth it? Right? Right. So So first, people have to start off with that because I can help someone do it in 90 days because I did it. The question is, are they willing to do what I did, mm-hmm. right? Because that, that's where it starts. Are they willing to do what I did? It was mm-hmm. legal. It was ethical, right? <laughs> As a Christian man, everything that I did, I'm proud of, okay? But are they willing to do what I did, mm-hmm. all right? Because, A, I was a full-on entrepreneur, Yeah. okay? So I, I didn't have a job. So time commitment is a part of it. OK, yes. sometimes I, I talk to people who currently have a job. They might make let's just use a round number. They might make 60 grand on their job. Right. They have a job. They work standard 40 hours. Nothing crazy. Right. 35 to 40 hours. They make 60 grand a month. Right. Uh, a, a year. And I say to them and, I you know, tell them my story. Hey, I'm, I, 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 may, I created a six figure income in, in 90 days. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, I, I want to do that. You know, I, I want to do it. And I asked them. How many hours a week are you willing to put in? Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, you know, uh, five, five, five to 10 hours. And I sell them flatly. You're not going to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean? Well, you work 40 hours a week right now <laughs> and you make 60 grand. But you think that I can teach you to make 100 grand 10 hours a week, right? Mm-hmm. Like the kids say, the math ain't mathing. Mm. <laughs> okay yeah so it starts going back to that commitment are you interested in making six figures or are you committed mm. okay because without that commitment commitment is i will do whatever it takes within go. my code of ethics yep. i will do whatever it takes that's right okay we live in the most magnificent mm. time in the world that's from right. a from an economic standpoint mm. right even though we have certain perils yeah. And turmoil on the economic landscape, we right. have way more opportunity than our parents and grandparents did. Okay. My father, he used to work here as a, in housekeeping in a hotel. Mm-hmm. Okay. In the Intercontinental Hotel, in New York City. He used to work part time. That was his full time gig in, in the yeah. evening. He used to work part time in the day as a superintendent in the Washington Irvin section of New wow. York City. And then sometimes before Uber, he would come home and, and, and taxi, you know, late at night. Wow. He worked three jobs just for us to be poor. Mm-hmm. OK, he didn't have the opportunities that we have now mm-hmm. where you can come home, you can podcast, you can create a YouTube channel. You know, you can start a side business. There's all these different opportunities that, that he wasn't privy to. Mm-hmm. OK, so a lot of times people will say. Oh, man, I wish I can do this. I wish I can do that. But we have to confront the elephant in the room. Yeah. Most people are lazy. Mm, tell it. Okay. Tell and it, I don't, Jose. I don't say, I don't say it disparagingly <laughs> as, as animals, as the human, as the flesh, we're wired for safety. We're wired to do less. Okay. So people want to go to work. And then come home and sit down and watch TV and play video games and then look at me and tell me that I'm lucky. (laughs) Okay? That I'm lucky. All right? I'm not lucky. I'm just willing to work harder than you. Mm. Okay? I'm willing to work harder than you. So I'm not saying that someone has to quit their job and have to be a full-on entrepreneur as I was. But what's your level of commitment? Okay? Okay? Because again, listen, not everyone wants to be wealthy and that's fine. Not everyone needs to be wealthy and that's fine. 
But if you do, you must be willing to do what wealthy people do. So if you're listening to this and you say, hey, I, I have a job, but I want to be wealthy. Well, listen, you don't have to quit your job today. OK, you, you, you might need to stay on that job, but let me help you or let someone that you want to emulate their level of success. Let that person help you create a plan that you can follow. Right. I, I, I'll give you this one quick example. I had this this guy that was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I want to do it. Yeah, I need to I need to change my life. I've been working at this job it's killing me. Da, 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 da. This was a Tuesday. And I said to him, all right, great. Well, listen, let, let, let's hop on a call tonight at seven o'clock. He said to me, oh, I, I can't tonight. I was like, I'm like, why? He was, oh, because, uh, you know, this is when I this is when I watch whatever show. I don't know. I don't know. I don't watch that much TV. I, the only show I really watch is Survivor. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that's not on Tuesday. And most of the time I watch it on replay because Wednesday nights I'm busy. And he was like, oh, no, I can't do it this night because of X, Y and Z. I said, you know what? I, I don't think this is for you. Like, oh, no, but I really want to do it. No, you don't. Right. And I, and I think that this is the, the biggest, quote unquote, nugget that anyone can take away. Right. If you want something that you don't currently have, the first question you must ask yourself, what am I willing to sacrifice? Because yes. like I said before, your current lifestyle, your current you know, existence is only going to give you the same homeostasis that you currently have. If you want something different, you have to do different. Okay, so look at your schedule, whatever whatever is composed of it right now. Look at areas that you can eliminate things. Well, you know what? Let's forget about bowling night. You know what? I'll, I'll see that. I'll DVR that. I'll watch it later. Okay, if you want to get successful, right? Because we all have 24 hours in the day. That's right. Period. Period. I can't give you more time. I can't say, hey, keep on doing what you're doing. We're going to add 26, two hours to the clock. Now you're going to have 26 hours. So now you have the two hours that you need to do what you got to do. It doesn't happen. You have to look at your 20 because your 24 hours are full. They're full of something. That's All right. True. You got to look at your 24 hours and you have to say, OK, what what am I going to take away from here? Man. Woo. Woo. You're the motivator. I'm going to call you <laughs> Jose the motivator. My gosh. You're, you're, you're dropping so many gems and so much knowledge and wisdom, brother. Um, um, and I want to respect your time because I just got a few few other questions for you. Yeah, you yeah, want. for sure. Okay. Um, so one, I would like to know how can people work with you, right? They, they've they heard this podcast today. Like, man, this brother just like bless my heart. Show me some things about my mindset that I need to correct from a, a mindset perspective and gave me some tricks some things to think about from a money perspective, stashing up, doing what the wealthy do, uh, having six months in reserve. Uh, how can somebody work with you? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, people, the, the easiest way to connect with me is through uh, Instagram. Uh, my handle is Mr. Wealth Mindset, M-R Wealth Mindset. So that's the easiest way to connect with me. Shoot me a message. Uh, the, the podcast launch is the Wealth Mindset podcast. It launched uh, April 11th, which is a Tuesday morning, 7 a.m. And uh, the people can email me at info at the Wealth Mindset Podcast dot com. So that's the easiest way, you know, to connect with me. And uh, like I said, I'm on a mission, you know, to help at least 25 people this year create that six figure income, because I know that there's a lot of people out there struggling. There's a lot of people that are, you know, in a, in a job, a career that's unhappy. There's a lot of people whose lives can be blessed and improved, not only personally, but then continue to bless other people. I know, I know there's marriages that can be improved, right? If, if, if we were out here making, making more money. So, uh, so that's, that's my goal, you know, to, to help as many people as I can, uh, empower themselves, change their mind because it, it all starts in the mind. Uh, you know, people, people think, you know, they, they want the how to's, they want the strategy and that's important. Right. But without the mindset, without the commitment, um, you'll, you'll never get there. Mm, good. So true. And, and then the last question I have for you, Jose, uh, you weren't prepped on this question at all. <laughs> But I know you got, I know it's in you. What's the difference between one's gift and one's purpose? Mm. One's gift and one's purpose. So I think that a gift is something that God puts in you. And then a purpose is uh, your gift is like, um, it, it, it's something that God gives you, right? But then the purpose is is how you manifest that 
into real life, right? So for me, you know, I, I, I've always loved cooking, right? And, but I think that there's a part of me that's also gifted at cooking because my sister is not as good cook as me, right? And we grew up with the same mom, all right? So it's not about the access to, but it's about that innate intrinsic quality of wanting, all right? So I think that like, you know, some people can just sing, all right? right some people true. can just sing, right? Some people are just funny, okay? Right. You know, like, like no one can teach you to be seven feet tall. <laughs> okay <laughs> right so sure. some of us just have natural gifts certain attributes that god puts in us right. okay now the purpose is when you find who you can help the best you see because one of my favorite books of my buddy evan carmichael wrote is built to serve mm -hmm. okay and he talks about that the major reason built that people are unhappy depressed, anxious, whatever, is because you're not serving enough people. There's been studies done on this, all right? The greatest pleasure centers in the mind, more than food, more than money, more than sex, is when we serve other people. Nothing makes us feel as good as helping and serving other people, okay? So the reason that people struggle to figure out their purpose is because they're looking inward. Mm. What can I do that would give me fulfillment mm. instead of looking outward? Who can I help that would give me fulfillment? Mm. Okay. Mm. Fulfillment is never going to come from you doing things for yourself. Going back to the why. Okay. Mm. You need to have a why that's bigger than your butt. It needs to be bigger than you because you will always get in your own way. Mm -hmm. You will always prefer to sit on the couch and do nothing and watch TV or let the TV watch you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that we're called by God to serve each other, right? That's what Jesus did, right? right. Jesus washed people's feet. Jesus fed people. Jesus performed miracles. Jesus healed. Jesus right. didn't sit around and say, hey, worship me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. I'm the son of God. Jesus lived a life of service, mm. right? He fasted, he prayed, okay? He was tolerant, he was loving, right? And so, you know, the, the whole mantra of being a Christian is to be more like Jesus. That's right. Okay? So when you look at it from that uh, perspective, it's about service. So your purpose is found, you know, your gifts your gifts are the natural talents that God gives you, right? Which we, we said is not something that you want to bury, right? right? Something that you want to invest, something that you want to multiply, right. okay? But your purpose comes from you finding ways to serve others, mm. okay? So as a chef, you know, hey, my, my gift is cooking, but that doesn't, have to, that doesn't have to mean that I run a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Like, actually, I, I retired from being a chef professionally but now cooking is my ministry, mm. right? So I cook for church events or for people inside of the kingdom, okay? Mm. Or, or for the men's ministry or, you know what I mean? Or I just get together. So it's still my gift, mm. but how am I manifesting that gift, That's right? Cool. Also, that, that skill, if you will, is kind of a foundational characteristic that I can transfer into other things mm. because the the at the core of it is helping serving nurturing mm. right so when i go into another endeavor i can still bring those qualities That's right good. because of my gift of helping serving and nurturing That's okay right. so your gift is is who god made you your mm. purpose is how is how you fulfill um you know, what, what he's put upon your, upon your life, because it can change, right? right? It can change. That's so true, man. Well, well, well said eloquently put brother, you blessed the socks off me. And I know the people listening feel, will feel the same way. So thank you, brother, so much. Um, we gotta, we gotta get you back when the book is out and, sure. and, and, uh, plug the book. I know that's coming and the, sure. I know the show's it. coming real soon. Um, we, we're going to plug all the notes in the bottom, but thank you so much, man, for, 
for pouring out your gift with us today and blessing us. We truly Amen. appreciate it. Amen. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, man. It's been a pleasure. This is this is what my wife calls a divine appointment. You know, there are there are no mistakes. So That's I right. appreciate you. Um, I'm, I'm thankful right. for you and your audience. I hope that God continues to bless you and make you a blessing to others. And uh, I'm just very thankful. 